Good evening. Welcome to Victory Baptist Church tonight. Let's all get a song. We'll stand and turn to page 155. Page 155. <laughs>
people each and every day. Uh, there's so many things to do for us, we just take for granted a lot of times, and we don't even think about uh, things that we do for us, just like being able to get up in the morning, Father, and being able to get up and get around and be able to recognize yourself, Father, and what a blessing just for that, Father. We just thank you for that. Most of all, Father, we just thank you for dying for us, taking our place on the cross, Father, that we'll be in heaven with you. Father, all these requests that you've heard tonight, we ask you to accept them in a mighty way, Father, to lift them up. We need that touch of the Father, for healing and for mercy, Father, for all the pain. Please help us, Father. Father, just help us to uh, do what we need to do each and every day, Father, as we go out into this world. We come in contact with so many people. So many people are out there lost, Father. Hey, they just need a word. They need a word from us many times. Many times it's uh, hard to be bold to step up and tell them about that word and tell them about you and what you have done, Father. So we need that little nudge from you, Father, out in this world each and every day, Father. We need to be able to tell people about your salvation, Father. We have for that help from you today. Father, we just ask you to come and be with us tonight, Father. And Touch hearts, Father, tonight. We just sing and praise and give joy to you, Father. We want everything to done that's done here tonight to be for you, Father. Father, we just ask you to pray with you. All right, let's do a song, let's stand and turn to page 36. Page 36.
his church run thing going up there. So if you caught him out here, it's good. We uh, have Brother Paul much in tonight, and his family is with us. We have Brother Paul and his family come to come and sing and preach and have a good time. Amen. It's good to be back. Hope everybody got a good nap. Amen. We'll have to pray for us as we sing. Remember your words, Mr. Bryson. could tell you I'm nothing and I would be telling the truth I could say I am worthless a hopeless sinner that's true but that is just part of the story told everything I was lost reborn and made a child of the king I am a royal descendant of a king from Jerusalem thing to say I am royal and declaim that my father's a king I'll have to take you to an altar where it happened many years ago I met this king I was washed his blood and that's all I know I am a royal descendant of a king from Jerusalem I'm a part of the bloodline of Jerusalem. How in this world could I stand and say such a thing? To say I am royal and declare that my father's a king. 
to take you to an altar where it happened many years ago. I met this king. I was washed in his blood, and that's all. We're gonna let we're gonna sing one, then I think I'm gonna have Ashley sing one. Uh, forgot the name of that song. One more time. There we go. I'm grateful that uh, no matter what, we have something to be thankful for, and that's the way this song goes. Today I faced a mountain Once again it seemed so tall I tried to climb But it seemed I'd surely fall So I knelt and called on Jesus Just as always I felt his presence, his hand of mercy lifted me just in time. I want to thank him. I want to praise him. His grace has been sufficient. And like before, he's given victory one more time. Standing by my side when the valley was long and the river was wide. So I want to thank him. I want to praise him one more time. Looking back upon this journey since the day I first met him many times his love and mercy has rescued me so once again I come before him one more time I'll stand to praise him for all his blessings yes he has been so good to me Oh, I want to thank him. I want to praise him. His grace has been sufficient. And like before, he's given victory one more time. He was always standing by my side when the valley was long and the river was wide, so I want to thank him. I want to praise him one more time. He was always standing by my side when the valley was long and the river So I want to thank him, I want to praise him.
praise him one more time. One more time. We're going to let her sing one more. I know I love to hear her sing this song. And I'm grateful that we are not worthless. And he died for us, even though we didn't deserve it. I'm glad he died for us. And that just shows that our lives mean something to him. So we'll listen to her sing this one. thought about this song actually this morning while he was preaching about Mephibosheth. How many times um, I'm sure Mephibosheth went through life going, I'm worthless, I'm worthless, I can't do anything, I can't. And how he became, um, how he was something in the king's sight. And I, I love these words of this song, so listen to the words, please. She could hear people whisper as she walked toward the well. Five husbands, many rejections, was all her life could tell. Till she met that Nazarene who told her all of these things. She no longer felt despised. When she realized that I'm not worthless to him, and he loves me like I am his dearest friend. And The king hung on that hill, the crowd mocking him still. His father even turned away. What on earth caused him to stay? Could it be he saw my face? Could it be his redeeming grace? Could it be it was me that held that king to that tree? For I'm not worthless to Like I am his dearest friend, and though he knew what I was, he loved me then, and he still does. I'm not worthless to him. No. Worthless to him, and he loves me like I am his dearest friend. And though he knew what I was, he loved me then, and he still does.
understand that. Certainly wasn't worth dying for. But I'm grateful that through the eons of time, he looked down through the ages and he's seen a young, young mustion boy who was destined and doomed for hell. And he says, I needed a solution for that. And so he, in his plans, he always had it planned. I don't understand that, how, how that happens, but he had already had it planned for the cross to take place. And I'm uh, grateful for that. I'm thankful that he loves me for who I am. In spite of me, he still loves me. Um, I'm my biggest downfall on most, most occasions. I, uh, I hurt me more than anybody else, and, uh, but I'm grateful that he loves me. Be turned into the book of Joshua, chapter 6. Again, I want to thank you all for your hospitality. Thank you all for allowing us to be, be here. Uh, for those who offered to take us to lunch today, thank you. Um, as I said, we have family in this area. We don't get to see them much, and when my... My family found out we were going to be here. My phone started ringing and wanted us to, uh, and, uh, but it was a good time, good afternoon, spent laughing, reminiscing about old times, and, and uh, it was an enjoyable afternoon. So, but I am grateful for your allowing us to do that. Uh, Joshua chapter 6, I won't be long tonight, but this is what's on my heart. Joshua chapter 6, I'm going to read one verse uh, in the text, but we will cover verses 1 through 22, but I'm going to read verse 1, Joshua chapter 6, verse 1, the Bible says, Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. I am reminded of several years ago of a viral story that came about. And in a nutshell, the way this story happened, this young man was working at a uh, local hotel and he received a phone call on the local number and it was a lady trying to make a reservation over the phone. Well, this particular chain did not allow the, the receptionist to make reservations. So he explained to the lady, ma'am, you're going to have to call the 1-800 number, and you're going to have to make the reservations there. We have availability, and we, we want you to stay with us, but, but I can't make that reservation for you. Well, she didn't necessarily like that, but she hung up, and she, a few minutes later, she called back and began to get more elevated and a little more uh, agitated in the whole situation, and she began to speak in a way that probably wasn't polite. After all, this young man was only doing what he was told. And again, he said, ma'am, I'll tell you what, you hang on, I'll try to call the 1-800 number for you, and I'll try to make the reservation for you because we want you to stay here. Well, she didn't like that idea either, and she began to get elevated and, and got louder on the phone. And throughout this conversation, she began to make some some racial slurs that probably were uh, in a, inappropriate at best. And the next thing you know, she began to make the slurs directed toward the man she was talking to. And he then told her that, ma'am, I'm not going to have to talk to you anymore. And he hung up the phone. He called his boss, told his boss what had happened. And his boss said, well, you know, we have a policy here and that is not tolerated. So therefore, we do not want her staying at our hotel. Well, a few minutes later, who comes walking through the door? <laughs> this lady. Well, she realized what she said and how bad it was. So she went in trying to be apologetic. And through being apologetic, the young man said, Ma'am, let's just put it this way. It is above me now. It's above me. Now, in other words, there's nothing else I can do. It is above me now. And that's what I want to title this simple thought here. It's above me now. 
in the first verse, we read of a dire situation. The children of Israel have made it to Jericho. They have made it to their final destination, but yet they can't get in. And they are in a situation that is above them. They are in a situation that seems hopeless. They are in a situation that seems uh, impossible, if you will. But I want you to understand there will be times in your life where God allows situations to come in your, your, your family and in your personal uh, endeavors that when you look at that situation, you will say this is a hopeless situation. This is an impossible situation. Can I just tell you, there are circumstances, there are times you're going to have circumstances that you have to put into God's hand. There are some people that you're just going to have to put in God's hand. Uh, there's, there are some problems that you're going to have to put in God's hand. There's some sickness that you're just going to have to put in God's hand. There's some financial struggles that you're just going to have to put in, in God's hand. I'm not as old as some, but I'm older than... I mean, I'm getting in the, the, the second half of that now. I used to say I'm young, but I'm not that anymore. But at 44 years old, I can tell you that there have been times in my life where an impossibility has come before me. And if it wasn't for that impossibility, I would have to do nothing. I couldn't do nothing for myself. I couldn't help the, process, the, the situation. I had to turn it over to him. Can I just say, when you find yourself in that situation, it's not a dead end. It's not over. Even though it seems impossible, it's not over. Uh, one of my friends, Steve Wager, said this. He says, if you can explain it, God probably didn't do it. And how true that is. Many times in our life, we try to do it ourselves because we want to walk into church and say, well, look what I did. Look how we handled this. Look how my family handled this. Look how the church handled this. Look how the pastor handled this. No, when he puts these situations in our life, he does an puts an impossible situation. So when we walk in, there's nothing we can say, but look what my God did. The children of Israel have had an eventful few years, to say the least. They've been, they were delivered out of bondage. They crossed the Red Sea. They spent 40 years in the wilderness. They crossed the Jordan River. And now they're at their final destination. And yet, here's another impossibility in their, in their face. When we think of Jericho, we often think of the kids' song, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. But it was much more than that. It was much more than that song. Jericho was a well-fortified city. If you would go to Jericho now, the very walls that we're talking about, the foundations of those walls are still on the ground. You can still go walk across those, the, the foundation of these walls. And if you were to go back and look at these walls, history says that these people built a 15-foot wall. And then they built a 26-foot wall on top of that. And by the time they made the, 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 the structure sound, it was approximately 40 feet tall. That's a pretty big wall. And I always laugh. I was like, well, if you were to climb that wall, then you got to fall off that wall to do anything. And I don't know if I want to do a 40-foot fall. But here they have this wall that's seemingly insurpassable. But then Jericho sits on a hill. Or, uh, and, and anybody who knows anything about combat and war knows that we want, you want the high ground. You don't want to be the one climbing the hill in a, in a tactical situation. You're, you're at a disadvantage. Um, and and in my, I can tell you numerous times in my life where that has become a reality in my own life where, where you, you need the high ground to, to progress forward. But Jericho was a well-fortified city. And to make that even worse, Jericho's troops were extremely uh, experienced fighters. And here comes the old Israelites. They just spent 40 years in the wilderness. 
They were in bondage for years before that. Never been in a war. And God is saying, there's your city, go take it. There's your city, go take it. I want you to know, on paper, they were the underdog. But in reality, the, the battle was already won. Today, this evening, you may be looking at an event in your life that looks like an impossibility. You say, my resume is not as, is not as thorough as theirs. You say, my bank account is not as big as I think it needs to be. You say, my, 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 my wit doesn't match that one. But I want you to know, my, my, your, your personal situation may look impossible. But to God, it's already happened. He has already orchestrated it in your life so that you would come up to this impossible situation and he has a solution for you. God will do what others can't do. So how will you get past your wall? We've all had that, 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 that in our lives. Maybe it's sickness, bad news from the doctor, a, 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 a phone call that you just wanted to wish you didn't answer. How do you get past your wall? Well, in the Bible... In our text, if we read verse 2, the Lord's already telling Joshua that it's already theirs. He says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I've given it, given into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. God has already told Joshua that it's theirs. He said the victory is there, but to, <clears throat> excuse me, but to get to this victory, I've got to give you a list of instructions to follow. I'm going to give you some tasks to do. And if you do these tasks, the victory is yours. What were these instructions? What was these tasks that he's talking of? The first thing I see in these instructions was they were instructed to walk around the wall. Now, y'all going to need a dictionary. Y'all going to probably need a, a concordance. Y'all going to probably need a uh, Google to help you because this is deep what I'm getting ready to say. They had to walk around the wall. Everybody get that? I don't want to go over your heads with that. They had to walk around the wall. Have you ever wondered why God designed it that way? I mean, let's face it. If we were God, we would have walked right up to it and said, all right, that's it. There it went. That's, what, that's how I think of things. Man, y'all had a rough go. Y'all been in the wilderness 40 years. You just come across the Jordan River. You just built that cool monument with all the 12 stones so you can go back and tell your kids how good God's been to you. Well, watch this. I'm going to add to that story. There's your city. Have at it. But it didn't happen like that. They were told to walk around the wall. They were told to walk around the wall one time a day for six days and then seven times on the seventh day. If I figure right, I'm not real smart. I took the, the extended version of high school. and uh, But if I counted right, that's walking around this wall 13 times. Some scholars suggest it was done for reconnaissance reasons. Well, on the surface, that might sound good. But it's a 41-foot stone wall. We're going to walk around it. And, hey, yep, 41 foot over here. Hey, is it 41 foot back there? Yep. I don't need to walk around that wall to know that. It's 41 foot all the way around. So that, that wasn't it. They wasn't going there to, 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 to recon the area. But why were they there? Why did God plan it this way? Number one, I think he planned it this way so the obstacle could be observed. God said, watch what I'm getting ready to do. I want you to walk around this wall so you just realize how impossible it is. Good. Let's look at it. Look at it over there. There's nothing I can do for that. They just had to look at it. I can imagine when Joshua got this battle plan, he probably said, you sure? Are you positive? Did I hear that right? Walk around the wall. And I can, and again, I can just imagine these guys walking around it going, I got a plan. Hey, y'all come here, I got a plan. And we're going to do that. No, that ain't going to work either. And day two comes around. And the next guy says, I got a plan. Mine will work. Y'all come over here. And, no, that's not going to work either. 
But by day six, all their plans that they thought they had had been exhausted. All their ideas had been, been, been negated. And the next thing you know, they're walking around this wall going, I don't even know why I'm walking around the wall. We are not going to be able to push the wall over. We can't climb it. There's nothing else we can do. But God said, or Joshua told God, we just got to walk around the wall. So I guess I'm just going to walk around the wall. The obstacle had to be observed. Again, by them knowing how impossible that wall was when it fell, all they could say is, look what our God did. You say, I got bad news from the doctor. That impossible situation when, it, when God heals you, you can't say anything but look what my God did. They walked around it so the obstacle could be observed, but also so the opponent would be oblivious. Now just imagine, they're walking around the wall, and they're watching them. What are these idiots doing? And I'm sure they, they, they poked fun at them. I'm sure they were making fun of them. Day two. Hey, Phil, they're back. Look at them. What are they doing? Ah, idiots. Day three, they're back. Can you believe it? Third day, they're back. Day four, they were like, I ain't even going out there. I'm sure they're back. I hear them. Listen to that. It sounds like a herd of buffalo walking outside that wall. I ain't even need day five, they didn't even get out of bed. Day six, they were eating breakfast when all of it happened. They, they got so oblivious to, the, to two million Jews walking around the wall that they didn't even care. Isn't that amazing how God can do that? He can just have us walk around the wall, and yet our enemy becomes oblivious to what God's getting ready to do. One of the signs that you, that, that you trust God is that you show up anyway. So what are you talking about? Abraham trusted God, but he still climbed the mountain. Hey, Gideon trusted God, but he still had to go fight the battle. Hey, you, you say, I trust God. Well, you still have to go to the doctor tomorrow. You say, I'm going to trust God. You still have to go to that job tomorrow. Hey, I'm going to trust God. You still have to uh, do, deal with that family situation. Sometimes in trusting God, we just got to keep walking around the wall. And that's what they were doing here. They had to show up. But they also had to, I don't, this is, just my preaching, I'm sorry, but they had to shut up. Look at the text that goes on in, our, in the text and tells them that they were not allowed to talk. It says, uh, it says in verse and seven priests shall therefore, shall compass, verse three, shall compass the city. All ye men go around about the city once. Thus shall this do six days. The seven priests shall bear the ark of the covenants, rams, and shall blow the trumpets. And it shall come to pass when they make a long glass. This is given the instructions, I'm sorry. And you get down in a, uh, after Joshua, and it's in verse, uh, I've, I've, I've just blew it, uh, uh, verse 10. And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout, nor make any noise. Well, my kids wouldn't have been able to go. Because we would have got kicked out of that party. Yep, it would have been like, all right, no talking. Are we ready? Here we go. Hey! All right, mustings, y'all are out. Y'all go back to camp. They couldn't talk. They had to walk around this wall silently. Joshua didn't even give them all the details. I don't think Joshua knew all the details. He just knew they were going to walk around the wall, and God said, I'll deliver the city to you. My boys, again, they talk all the time. You ever tried to plan a surprise for your kids? You ever tried that? You know, all right, here we go. Where are we going, Dad? Surprise. We ever been? No. Is it inside or outside? Outside. Do we have to watch or do we get to play? We're watching. Huh. Will they have a concession stand? No. Okay. We're not going to a baseball game. They, they will go and go and go, and by the by seven, ten minutes into this journey, I'm ready to turn around and go home. I don't even care about the surprise anymore. I want to throw them out the car. The children of Israel were humans too. You don't think they were having some questions? What are we doing? Six days they had to be silent. 
walking around that wall. I had no clue what was going on. And you say, why do they have to be quiet? Well, they were like us. <laughs> there's, there's one of them going to be like, my feet are hurting. My feet hurt. Joshua, how much longer we got? My, my, my knee just gave out. Hold on, y'all, hold on. That's me. My knee would have gave out. Because they like us. They had to be quiet, though. You may look at a situation and think, that's impossible. But we got to get in our head with God, all things are possible. You may look at a situation and think, this is never going to end. But we need to get in our head, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. You may think that you're outnumbered, but you need to get in your head, greater is he that is in the world. Sometimes, though, we need to focus on what we know in the Bible and just be quiet. The first instruction they had to follow was to walk around the wall. The second instruction they had to follow is in verses 5 and, and also verse 20. They had to worship below the wall. Now it's day 7. They got to walk around the wall seven times. It's about eight miles. And I don't know about y'all, I don't, I don't like to walk. I quit walking when I turned 16 years old. And I got a key. Now I drive. I don't even want to walk to the mailbox. It, sometimes my mailbox gets so full, I know my mailman's mad at me because I don't even like to walk to the mailbox. But they had to walk seven times around the wall. And like I said, I'm sure they're like us. There was somebody that was complaining about that. Seven times? Seven times we got to walk around. But you know, the only way that wall was going to fall was for the next set of instructions to be followed. I'm reminded of a story. In 1866, D.L. Moody was conducting a series of meetings. And during these meetings, a young man stood up to give his testimony. And during that testimony, he made this quote. He says, I'm not quite sure about everything, but I'm going to trust and obey. There was a man in there, a Mr. Tanner in there, and he said, well, that's a good statement. He's jotted it down, went home that night and penned these words. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Sometimes in life we just have to trust and we have to obey. We don't like that. We don't like these instructions because we don't, they're not our plans. They're not our ideas. But sometimes when he tells us to do something, we have to trust and we have to obey. But to worship before the wall, below the wall, there was two things that had to happen. First thing had to happen is there had to be a sound from the horn. Uh, the Bible says in, in, in verse uh, 19, but all the silver and gold, the vessels, brass, iron, uh, and they shall come in the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpets. In this time, trumpets signified going to war. That's how they knew to go to war. And... So the blowing of the trumpets was telling them it's about, to, it's about to go down. But also the blowing of the trumpets was so the people in the, the back knew what was going on in the front. It's two million people. How would you like to listen for something half a mile in front of you knowing that your, the, the, the results of this rely on that? So God said, okay, when you hear the trumpets sound, you got to shout. So there was a sound from the horn, but then there was the shout from the people. They had to shout. And I like it. The Bible says, verse 16, the Bible says, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. So then it says, so the people shouted in verse 20. But everyone had to shout. Everyone had to shout. How would you like the walls not to fall in because you were sitting there and you were scared you were going to embarrass yourself? How would, the, how would you like to be the one that, that, did, that didn't shout? Maybe the walls didn't fall. Everyone had to shout. The shout was the people thanking God for the victory. In, in our churches today, people get to the point of worship and they think it's for somebody else. Uh, there's somebody else over here better, better do that shout, not me. That's not me. 
I know the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, but I think some of the other redeemed probably ought to do that one. I know the Bible says, make a joyful noise. So I hope somebody over here makes a joyful noise because I'm just going to sit here and, and, be, and not, not, not do that. But I got news for you. If you're facing an impossible situation and things seemingly aren't going your way, the thing holding that impossible situation back could be your very shout. Because look what I'm telling you right here. The trumpets blew and they shouted while the wall was still standing. Look at the story. The walls didn't fall and then they shout. Because we can all do that. I got a bad news from the, I got bad news from the doctor. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm healed. He God he misread the report. Whatever. We can all shout when the impossible situation falls. But sometimes we gotta shout facing the impossible situation. It wasn't until they shouted, looking at the wall, that the wall fell. There are many people who like to worship after the wall fell. But we need to worship while the wall's still standing. God may be waiting on your shout to remove the wall. The first instruction, walk around the wall. The second instruction, worship below the wall. The third instruction was dealing with the wrecking over the wall. The text says that the wall fell down flat. Flat. Six days they walked around the wall. What if they'd have quit? What if day seven they would have walked around five times and been like, I'm done. This is stupid. This, I can't believe our preacher's got us doing this. Can you believe that the man of God who we love and we know is right for our church has got us doing this? I quit. I'm leaving. What if six and a half rounds around the wall Somebody quit. What would you miss? Can I tell you, in our Christian life, oftentimes we have people that are this close from getting the victory, this close to seeing the walls fall down, and they're quitting. They're backing away. They're saying, I can't do it anymore. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. I am not going to go to revival. I've done this too much. I'm wore out. I quit. There was a destruction of the confound. The wall fell down flat. That word flat literally means underneath. In other words, the walls imploded. I think of these large demolition companies that when they, they implode a building, they, they, they put dynamite in certain places, and the building literally falls within itself. That's what happened to the, the walls. It literally fell within itself. And there's so much in this. The walls fell, and they were able to walk over the wall. Now, this is me being logical and critical thinking, I guess. 41, I don't want to sound disrespectful, 9-11, that we just celebrated the, the anniversary of that. When those buildings fell, how high was the debris? I mean, it was four or five stories high. We got a 40 foot, 41 foot wall, 40 foot wall that just implodes, and the people are able to walk over it. You ever thought about that? There's no big, big big rocks left because they'd had to climb over it. They stepped over it. God said, you do what I say you're supposed to do. You follow my instructions. Not only will I knock the wall down, I'll make it where it's not even hard to walk over. You just can kind of just stroll across it. There's the destruction of the confines. Then we see the deliverance in the city. They got there, they took every single thing just like God said. So I said all that to say this. Are you facing a wall tonight? We don't like those situations. We don't like when we run head first into an impossible situation. But are you facing a wall? Maybe you're just seemingly walking around it right now. You think what you're doing is just kind of a waste of time. God, I, you, you even, do you awake, sir? God, or do you even know what I'm going through? You're just kind of walking around. Maybe he's waiting on you to worship while the wall is still standing. Maybe he's just waiting on you to thank him, to give him thanks for what he's going to do. That could be what's going to cause your wall to fall. Or maybe you just got to go ahead and step over the wall and go get what he's already got. Some of us are so mesmerized when the wall falls, we just stand there and look at it. 
can't believe the Lord did that. I know I said if that wall would move, I'd do that. Can you believe that? He knocked the wall down on me. Man, hey, he knocked the wall down. And we're still sitting here on this side of it. I don't know where you're at tonight, but it's a fair state. It's a fair statement to think that in a room with this many people, somebody may be looking at a wall. Somebody may be staring at a wall. And he wants to he wants to show you the impossible. Heads bowed and eyes closed tonight. You could stand as someone comes to the piano and just plays a minute. I don't know what you're going through, what you're facing, but I'm glad that I serve a God who has orchestrated where you are. You didn't surprise him when you went to the doctor and got that bad news. It didn't surprise him when you walked into work and got laid off. Hey, it didn't surprise him when when you had that family problem. Oh no. In fact, this is not real. This is this is kind of deep. All the problems that we have are sifted through his faint, his hands before they ever come through us. Think of Job. Job's problems came right through the hand of God. Your impossible situation may have you overwhelmed, but he's given us some instructions to handle it. Lord, we thank you tonight for the instructions that you've given us. Lord, I thank you for how you are a God who specializes in the impossible. God, I'm grateful that you put situations in our life so when they are overcome, when you overcome them, we have nothing to say but look what my God did. And God, I pray that you would help us. Bless these dear folks. Keep your hand upon this church. In Christ's name, amen. That was good, Brother Paul. We appreciate that. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Been a great day today. We got to come to the Lord's house today. We got to worship Him. And we got to just love Him and put our arms around Him. And He put His arms around us. And hey, what a great time we've had today. We're thankful for Brother Paul and Sister Ashley and their family there, Father, that they were able to make the trip today, Father. And uh, let us pray on that. Father, we just. Uh, Thank you for everything here today, Father. And, Father, we just ask you to give uh, Paul and his family traveling grace as they travel back home uh, whenever they go, Father. And, Father, just keep them safe. Uh, just keep them from all the harm that is out there, Father, and, and just be with them each and every day, Father. And, Father, we thank you for this family, Father, that travels around and goes to different places and preaches the word, Father. Uh, keep your hand on the man of God here, Father, and just help him. Father, we just thank you. We just love you, Father. We thank you for everything you do for us each and every day, Father. So many things that, like I say, at times we tend to overlook those things, Father, just the simple things of life. But, Father, we thank you, Father. And most of all, we thank you for loving us, for dying for us, and taking our place, Father. That we'll be in heaven with you one day, Father, in eternity. We thank you and we love you and we ask and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Like I say, it's been a great day today. Uh, don't forget about the upcoming service on Wednesday night. Uh, and also about the barbecue that the youth is going to have. Uh, like I said, it's all to help the youth to uh, raise funds for uh, this next coming summer, the riots. And I can tell you, it's worth it. Uh, I went down there with the youth uh, this past year, and man, what a great time. To see 4,000 young adults out there and just worshiping the Lord, and it just, uh, just doesn't get any better. It's just great. And you can tell that the Lord's in the house. So we need to continue to support the youth, as you always have supported the youth. And uh, like I said, uh, 
We want to see them be our future. We want to see them grow up and take all this church over. And, uh, when I'm older than what I am, they'll be in charge, and they'll be up here and doing the things. They've already got a good youth choir, and everything's going good, and I just appreciate everything. So uh, continue, if you will, to help them out. Brother Paul, if you and your family would like to go to the back, and uh, when we dismiss, we'll uh, go see Brother Paul and his family there and, and uh, tell them what a good time we had today. I feel like we've been blessed today, again, as we always are blessed. I uh, feel like I say, being in the Lord's house and uh, having Brother Paul and his family here to preach to us today. It's been a wonderful day. Everybody have a great evening. Be, be safe going home. There's a lot of crazies out there, especially this time of night. Several times when we left the church, we went down number one, and people are on the wrong side of the road coming this way more than once, more than once. And, uh, so I worried about Sister Martha. She lives, she goes that same way, and I worried about her at times with them people because I knew she was either in front of me or in back of me, and here these people were on the wrong side of the road coming. And that's happened about two or three times with us. So uh, everybody be careful out there. Watch out for everybody and be safe. Hey, it's been a good day. Everybody take care, and we'll see you later. Jordan.